Welcome to Bokeh Canyon Church Online. We see our online service as an opportunity to be the church in a new way and extend our purpose to see everyone awaken to the love of God, growing in the love of God, and living out the love of God. On Sundays, Bokeh Canyon Church gathers together here in the Santa Clarita Valley and beyond to take part in worship, a message, and community. Bokeh Canyon Church is a place of hope where we connect with Jesus and each other. So don't forget to share our online service with friends and family. Let them know you're at church and you would like them to join you because we are better together. For more information about being a part of Bokeh Canyon Church, go to our website, bokehcanyonchurch.com for meeting times, upcoming events, past sermons, sermon notes, and giving. At BokehCanyonChurch.com, you can also let us know how we can be praying for you or how we can help with physical needs or assistance. Just fill out the communication card easily found by clicking on the Connect tab. We are so excited you have joined us this Sunday. Now let's join together to worship our Heavenly Father. Well, good morning and welcome to Bokeh Canyon Church. I'm Pastor David Beaver and I'm so happy that you're here. I know I look like I just got off a shift at Trader Joe's, but it's just because I like this shirt. But anyways, I just want to say welcome and I'm glad that you're joining us today. If you uh, want to go to our website, bokehcanyonchurch.com, you can find our church online interactive button there on the homepage. Click on that button and it'll take you to Church Online. Why is that important? Because with Church Online, you can say hello to your friend and you can communicate during the service. You can give a big old shout and amen to something powerful that Billy says. You can uh, do a connection card and you can fill out and let us know a little bit about yourself. If you're not getting emails from us about upcoming events and such, then that means we don't have your information. So just go to that, fill it out, and we can then get your inf correct information and get you emails in regards to anything coming up. There's the online giving tab at the top right hand side and at the bottom there's prayer requests. Fill out a prayer request with any needs or concerns that you have and we will bring those to the Lord. Monday mornings at 9 a.m. right out here in the back patio we gather together and we pray for those prayer needs. We pray for our country and it needs a lot of prayer right now. We pray for our community and we pray for God's blessing upon this great country. And um, we just want to let you know that we do pray for those prayer requests. We continue to pray for those prayer requests until we hear that we don't need to pray for them anymore. So if there's been an answer to prayer, let us know so we can praise God with you and um, put more things on the list. My next announcement is our next outdoor worship service is January 16th, right out here on the big patio, January 16th at 5 p.m. Outdoor worship, gathering together, singing, lifting our voices to the Lord. Bring your own chair, bring your mask. We'll sit out on the patio, we'll gather together, and we'll just have a great time of worship and fellowship together. Pastor Billy and I were talking as we were getting ready for announcements today. It was June 16th, I believe it was, June 16th, June 14th is when we had our first outdoor worship service and it looked totally different. It was a big circle with just our camera and a microphone and it looked like a big campfire gathering. And um, that was a really great day. So you can find that on our, our website. Probably look at our Facebook old videos. It's really great to watch. We showed it live on Facebook and it was really awesome. But we're gonna be doing this again, as I said, January 16th at 5 p.m. And my last announcement, we have our annual business meeting. Sunday, January 31st at 11.30 in the morning. And that will be via Zoom. That is where we go over um, a recap of 2020. We talk about the things that we were able to accomplish. We uh, look at our business, our annual reports, and we talk about the plans and goals for 2021. And we have a lot of them. As I've said in my Thursday videos, um, 2020 was a great opportunity to share the Lord with others, and I really want to focus on that for 2021, really equipping us to be able to share our faith more and more with our community, our oikos, our sphere of influence. Well, anyways, 
Don't need to be preaching on that. I just wanted to let you know that annual business meeting, Sunday, January 31st at 1130 via Zoom. We'll send out that Zoom link as we get closer to that date. So make sure that we have your correct email address so you know that you can join that meeting and hear what we're up to for 2021. Well, God bless you and thank you. Have a great day. Enjoy the service. Thank you, Pastor David. Welcome, everybody, to Boca Canyon Church. I hope you're ready to worship. I'm Pastor Billy Ford. I realize it's been a tough week in our nation. There's been a lot that's gone on, and we'll address some of that later, but there's no better way to really address it than to take it to the Lord and to worship Him in the midst of it all. And we're about to worship God right now, and we're going to set our sights above all the turmoil on this earthly level. We're going to put our sights into heavenly places where we know that the Lord is in control and he has good things in store and he is the savior of the world. And we're going to start with that song, Savior of the World. And I'm, I'm really excited to worship the Lord with all of you this morning. And as, as we go through the songs, I encourage you, turn your hearts to him, your full attention, Give him praise, worship him. Let's begin with prayer. Father, we give you this time. We come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. We ask for your blessing on this service. And everyone tuning in right now, we ask that you would bless them and draw their attention to you and let people experience their faith being lifted, more peace, more joy, more encouragement, and let us shine for you. We worship you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing about the Savior of the world. It's God so loved that he gave his son to lay down his life for the sake of us. He bore the weight of our sin and shame with a cry he said it is finished Christ the Lord overcame the darkness he's alive death has been defeated for he made us a way by which we have been saved he's the savior of the So we lift up a shout for his fame and renown. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, Jesus, Savior of the world. We must spread the of his soon return to reclaim the world for his glory let the church now sing of this coming king crowned with majesty our redeemer and he reigns ruler of the heavens and his For his fame and renown Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Jesus, Savior of the world Christ the Lord And his name 
It's Jesus the Messiah For He made us a way By which we have been saved He's the Savior of the world So we lift up a shout For His fame and renown Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Jesus, Savior of the world. Oh, He's Savior of the world. Oh, Lord, my God. When I in awesome wonder consider all the world's hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed, then sings my soul. My Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. That God is son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul. Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with a shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart? And I will bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, I God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. great thou art. You call me 
from the grave by name You called me out of all my shame The old has passed away The new has come You called me from the grave by name You called me out of all my shame The old has passed away Behold the new passed away My chains are gone Freedom You have given us freedom You have given us freedom My chains are gone Freedom You have given us freedom You have given us freedom my chains are gone Freedom You have given us freedom You have given us freedom Hallelujah Now I have resurrection power Living on the inside Jesus You have Praise the Lord. We do have that resurrection power, the same power that raised Christ from the dead is living in us once we put our faith in him. And I hope you believe that and you're walking in that. We're going to turn to God's word now and we're going to be in Philippians chapter 1 as we discuss joy. We started a small series on joy last week and what a time that we need joy in our lives. 
a lot of people feel very raw right now because of the events of this past week. A lot of people are hurting and brokenhearted, some because of the election outcomes, some because of watching our capital full of chaos and violence. And if you love our country, it is hard to see it reaching new lows, seemingly falling apart. It's a very difficult time. And many are also going through extremely difficult personal struggle and grief. Well, I can only point you to God and to his word, and that's what I'm going to do this morning. And guess what? His word has not changed since last week. It still says to rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. We looked at that last week, and yes, we are being majorly tested it's not easy to have joy. But just to review last week, we saw that there's a call to joy and it is, it is God's desire for you to have joy. It is also God's command to you to have joy. But you can't do it on your own. It, it has to be God's work in you, the Holy Spirit producing joy in you. And then it is God's power through you. When you have joy radiating from your life, it impacts other people. And so that was last week. Now today we're going to look at joy in the Apostle Paul's life. And we're going to look at the values of joy. He had certain values in his life that produced joy in him. Now some might feel that it just, they don't feel like being joyful. Maybe it's even inappropriate to even talk about joy right now. But I'd like to say that it's the perfect time to focus on joy. And it is possible to have joy in the midst of dark and difficult days. And how do I know? One reason is the book of Philippians in the Bible. When Paul wrote this letter to the Christians in the city of Philippi, he was full of joy. In fact, this letter of the Philippians is sometimes called a hymn of joy because in just four short chapters, the word joy or rejoice appears 14 times. And here's the kicker. Paul wrote this letter from prison. Despite his circumstances, he was joyful. How? Well, we saw last week, we need the Holy Spirit, and Paul had the Holy Spirit in his life. He also had a value system that helped him remain joyful even in terrible times. So we're going to look at those values Paul wanted the Philippians to have the same joy he had, and God wants you to have that same joy as well. Let's begin reading Philippians 1, verse 1. Paul begins his letter by saying, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Let's pause and pray. Lord God, we ask that you would bless this hearing of your word. Help us, Lord, to be the people you want us to be. Fill us with your joy. Shine it through us to the world around us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Paul planted the church originally in Philippi that he's now writing to. I, I, he did it years earlier before this letter. And I mentioned last week how he and his friend Silas were in a, a prison and they had been beaten and they were singing hymns of praise at midnight and the place was shaken and then the jailer and his whole household came to faith in Christ and they were full of joy. Here it is years later and Paul is in prison again, most likely in Rome. And again, he is singing praises. Did Paul struggle? Of course, he was human. But there was something going on on the inside of him that helped him rejoice even as he struggled. I, since a young age, have always liked things that spin, tops, 
you know, as a little kid playing with spinning tops and, and I like frisbees and discs and I really like gyroscopes. Uh, they're amazing to me. And I want to give you a little demonstration. I hope this works out okay. But a gyroscope, you spin it on the inside. And now I'm going to, whoops. All right, well, you saw it define gravity briefly. I'm not gonna try that again, because <laughs> I have to wind it all up again. But what a gyroscope does is it's there, it, it defies gravity. It can be up on one end and it doesn't fall the, the other way. Now, I was a physics major and when I see gyroscopes at work, I, it still feels miraculous to me and I, I've learned the physics behind it, but it just seems amazing. Gyroscopes are used to keep satellites pointed the right direction, to, to shift them. And I love this, cruise ships and other large ships, it, it, they help them stay stable in the water as they go through big waves so that people on the ship don't feel the rise and fall. It, it, it helps keep the ship oriented straight. And the thing about gyroscopes that make me think about joy is, is you can put a gyroscope in a box, you can't even see it, but if that thing's spinning, it will resist turning. If you try to force it in a certain direction, it resists that. It's the angular momentum. And you can't even see it, but it's happening on the inside. And we as Christians, God wants to be doing something in us. It's moving on the inside. It's joy. And it makes us resistant to the gravity of discouragement hopelessness that would pull us down but it's keeping us up it's it's defying that gravity and i don't know about you i want that in my life i want to be lifted up in the joy of the lord i want to be able to resist those forces pulling me down well paul had that in his life here he is in prison and he is full of joy in spite of those circumstances Let's look at the, va the values that he had. The first one we're going to look at here is humility. Paul starts his letter in a, a very unusual way. Verse 1 again, Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ. Servants of Jesus Christ. This is unusual because usually Paul would begin his letters saying he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. But here he says a servant, and the Greek word is doulos, which means slave. And the word slave has a bad ring in our ears. It's offensive sounding, but this was not a forced slavery. Paul is a willing slave of Christ. And a slave of God, a slave of Christ, is not benefiting God as much as being benefited from God. God is the one who blesses the one that serves him. And so Paul is serving God and he has joy as a slave of God. And he comes in humility to the Philippians. He doesn't say, hey, I'm an apostle, you better listen to me. He says, I'm a servant of Christ, I'm a slave. And this becomes one of the themes of the book, of the letter of Philippians. He wants the Philippians to learn to be humble also. So in chapter 2, verse 3, he tells them, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Amazingly, the same Greek word doulos for slave that he used of himself, he uses of Jesus in chapter 2, where Paul says that Jesus was in very nature God, but took the form of a slave. And he humbled himself. And God the Father raised him up and bestowed on him the name above all names. The path to joy is not through raising yourself up, but it is in serving God humbly. The world tries to find joy through gaining wealth, fame, and power, but the people who have such things usually aren't very joyful. But if you take a different path, the humble path before God, Things work out much better, and I realize this is counterintuitive, but it, it works. And why are humble people happier? Why are they more joyful? Well, first, they tend to experience the closeness of God. 
God gives us a promise, Isaiah 57, 15. He says, for this is what the high and exalted one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. He says, I'm going to, I'm going to be with the ones who are humble. They're the ones that will experience my presence, not the proud and arrogant. And then he says that he'll help them also. James 4 verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. The humble are not threatened. They don't have much to lose, so they're not insecure. They tend to be content. There's so much freedom in not thinking too highly of yourself not feeling threatened, not feeling entitled. You know, I'm not seeing a lot of humility in our world today. I'm not hearing many people saying, I'm sorry, or I was wrong, or I don't know. I might be mistaken about this. What I am seeing, I've been seeing a lot of it, is finger pointing. Instead of admitting fault, it's being said, well, your side is worse. When I was a kid, I was wrestling with a friend in our living room during Christmas season, and I, we rolled off the couch and rolled into the Christmas tree and knocked it over. It was a big Christmas tree, and it made a huge mess, a loud crash. All the adults came running in, and they saw the big mess on the floor, and they saw two preschool-aged kids pointing at each other. <laughs> we both were afraid of being blamed, and we're trying to blame the other guy. I feel like that's a picture of our society right now. The country is being damaged and everyone is just pointing at each other. Well, this is not the time for posturing and saying, well, at least we are better than the other side. That is not the path of humility. Humility admits fault. It does not assume it knows it all. It doesn't refuse to take ownership. But today we see that when there's a riot or violence, both sides are quick to jump at any claim that it was really the other side instigating it, that it was Antifa imposters in the Trump crowd, or it was white supremacists planted in the Black Lives Matter crowd. And now I'm sure that that happens, but that is not the whole story. The truth is both sides have extremist violent elements. And is anyone humble enough to say, my side makes mistakes. You know, that's not natural for the world, but it, it should be natural for Christians. In Romans 12, verse 2, it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And it's a common verse. We hear it a lot, but we don't always go to the very next verse. And here we see how Paul applies this. Verse 3, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. He's saying that it is natural and worldly to think too much of yourself, but don't conform to that pattern. Let your mind be renewed, and that includes facing the reality that you are not always right in your perspectives. The great people of faith in Scripture live this out. Nehemiah's prayer in Nehemiah chapter 1, speaking on behalf of the whole nation, he said, God, we have acted very wickedly. Daniel's prayer in Daniel 9, God, we have sinned and done wrong. Now, Daniel and Nehemiah both could have said, but God, the Babylonians are worse than us, or God, the Persians are worse than us. But they took ownership of their own sins and the sins of their own side. After Job had a humbling encounter with the Lord, he said, I put my hand over my mouth. We need more hands over mouths today. And yes, I see the irony in that I'm speaking right now. But believe me, I'm taking this message to heart myself. This is a time for prayer, prayerful reflection for the nation, but also for the church. And if you personally realize that you've been wrong about something, own up to it. You know, that's not losing, that's winning. Because Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 5, 
Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. The word blessed means fortunate, happy, joyful. Be humble. It's the path to true joy. All right, secondly, harmony. The letter to the Philippians is in the form of a personal letter, and it is full of affection. There is so much joy that can be found in good, healthy relationships. Well, our society is full of depressed people, and largely, I believe that comes from isolation and unforgiveness, bad relationships. But Paul had joy even in prison because he had friends, even if they were far away. Philippians 1, 4, and 5, he says, In all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy. Why? Because of your partnership. Your partnership in the gospel. They are his family, his team. And there is joy that comes from that. Now, it's been hard this past year to feel like much of a team as a church, I'm sure. It's been a weird time, but Paul still felt part of the team, even though he was far off and he was not meeting in person. He's stuck in a prison. But you know what? Relationships, and especially relationships that are in Christ, they transcend meeting together in person. God is with his people wherever they are, and we are connected. We are a family. I have had so much joy bumping into many of you, maybe at Central Park, around various places, and when I hear you say, hey, we, we watch all the time. We see your messages. It, you know, it's not that I am excited that people are watching me. Not at all, but that we're still a church. We're still together. I, I see that the numbers are, are strong and even going up a bit each week. And so I'm, I'm saying, wow, we're a team. We have good relationships and that brings joy. And by the way, I believe we are poised to come out of this pandemic stronger as a church than ever before. I really believe that, and I encourage you to be excited and prayerful about the future. Now, as joyful as Paul was, there was something that would make him even more joyful. He had heard that there were some strained relationships in the church in Philippi. And so in chapter 2, verse 2, he says, Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, and being one in spirit and of one mind. He knows how important harmony is, unity. There is so much joy when God's people are getting along. And so Psalm 133 verse 1 says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Amen. Why is it good and pleasant? Well, look down in verse 3. For there... The Lord bestows his blessing, even life evermore or forevermore. Unity, there's a blessing in it. There's a joy in it. Now, Paul is focused on this principle within the church, but I think there is an application in general society as well. Our nation needs more unity. It needs more peacemakers. And I encourage you to be a peacemaker. The United States has not been so united lately. Jack Beaver forwarded a small parable to me this past week about red ants and black ants put together in a jar and they got along fine until the jar was shaken and then they started fighting each other according to color and tearing each other apart, killing each other. And the point of the parable is that it wasn't the red ants that were the problem or the black ants that were the problem. It was the one shaking up the jar and friends, we have a, a, an enemy who is shaking the jar in our nation, and we must resist the tide of rage and hatred. We must follow Christ who has taught us to love our enemies. Now, we live in a pluralistic society. There are a lot of different kinds of people who have to somehow get along we recently celebrated the 400-year anniversary of the pilgrims coming over on the Mayflower, and there were two very distinct groups of people on that Mayflower that, that, that stayed. There, were, there was a third, that was the crew. But the, the ones that formed the Plymouth Colony, there were the pilgrims who were a church 
who were seeking religious freedom, but then there were the ones that the pilgrims called strangers. And, and they were mostly Christian, but they weren't really that devout. They weren't trying to escape the, you know, the oppression, religious oppression of King James and England. They just wanted to have a chance for a new life, make money in a colony. And so these two distinct groups of people formed a colony. They had different value systems and they made that Mayflower compact and they did it in such a way that they would have to enact laws that were the good, good for all of them. And, and that involved working with each other, making room for different opinions. Their job as devout Christ followers was not to be warriors and subdue the others who were not like themselves. How does that win people to Christ? Here's what it says in 1 Timothy 2, starting in verse 1. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority. I hope you are doing that right now for our nation. That, and why? That we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. God wants Christians, his people, to live peaceful, quiet lives. So that's why we pray for those in authority, that they'll do a good job. And it says, this is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. That's the heart of God. Now, I know it's become a dirty word nowadays, but there needs to be more compromise in politics in order for there to be more harmony. Now, I don't mean compromise your values, but we should have a, a value, a high value for harmony. And that means needing to make space for different types of beliefs, cultures, ideologies, just like the pilgrims and the other colonists had to figure out how to dwell together. And there's a principle in Christianity, and it kind of goes back to the humility of point number one, and that, that's that it's not the end of the world if we get wronged. It's not the end of the world if we get cheated. Our God is bigger than that. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 7, it says, The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you have been completely defeated already. There are Christians suing each other. And Paul says, why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? And I think that that principle of saying, hey, I don't have to win every little battle. If I come out at the wrong end of injustice, I'm going to be okay. Sometimes people lose by trying to win too hard. Well, Jesus talked about turning the other cheek. And it's time for the Christian church to be known for that again. And when that happens, I believe that in our own lives, but also in society, there will be more harmony and more joy. All right, the next value is hope. And even though things were difficult in Paul's life, he had unusual joy because he had hope. He had confidence in God. And here are a few examples of that here in Philippians chapter 1. In verse 18, he says, I will continue to rejoice. Why? Why, Paul, are you going to continue to rejoice? He says, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. He believed, he had hope that he was going to be set free from prison. And he believed that their prayers were a big part of that. So he said, I will rejoice. Verse 20, he says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed. Now he thought he might die soon. That, that, he had considered that, but he realized God still probably had a purpose for him. So in verse 25, he said, Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. He had joy. Why did he have joy? He had hope. Now hope is so important and it is related to faith. It gives us joy in the midst of the storm because you know the storm will pass. 
Now, we had hoped that 2021 would be better than 2020, and so far, it, it has not looked to be a huge improvement. But we still have hope because of God. He is still at work, and he will humble who needs to be humbled, and he will deal with whoever needs to be dealt with, and he will be glorified in the end. And we need, in the meantime, to speak hope into our world, to one another and into society. Because when people hear hope, it spreads joy. You know, many nations are gloating about America's troubles right now. We have a lot of enemies who love to see America struggling. But on Thursday morning, the day after the events of, at the Capitol in D.C., Capitol building, I read these words from Angela Mer Merkel in Germany, the Chancellor of Germany. She said, these pictures made me angry and sad. But I am sure American democracy, democracy will prove to be much stronger than the aggressors and rioters. And I got emotional when I saw those words from her because she spoke words of hope and they encouraged me. They gave me joy. And you know what? I think she's right. But even greater than the strength of American democracy is the power of God. And that is what Paul put his confidence in. Even when he sees troubles in the church in Philippi, he has hope. And so in verse 6, he says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Confident. So he had hope. When I was a kid, I loved riding in the back of a car at night, hearing the steady hum of the engine, the distant voices of my, of my parents as I drifted off to sleep. I wasn't afraid that they would get lost while driving or get in an accident. You know what? God is driving the car. We can let go of the, the panic grip let ourselves relax, stop screaming, look out, be still and know that he is God, as it says in Psalm 46, verse 10. People with hope can do that, and they will also have joy. And we have one more point here, a value that leads to joy, and that is holiness. Before Paul became a Christian, he tried to earn righteousness, right standing with God through his own effort, his own good works. But he found out that he could never be good enough on his own. But then he discovered the grace that turned sinners into saints and he was transformed. And so were the Philippians. And so he began his letter. If we look at verse one again, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi. He calls them holy people. Most translations translate that saints to all the saints in Philippi, holy people. You know, all true Christians are saints. The, the word means holy. Not because they are perfect, because the Philippians, they weren't. That's why Paul's writing a letter. He has to correct some issues going on with them. But in Christ, they were holy their slate was clean. Their sins were no longer counted against them. And you know what? That brings joy. Psalm 32 verse 1 says, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Amen. Have you ever been forgiven a debt that you weren't expected, expecting to be forgiven of? Uh, it's an amazing feeling. Or know you did something wrong and a police officer lets you off. One time we were on vacation and we were in a different state and we came into a town, it was a speed trap. Uh, and I immediately got pulled over for speeding, but not only speeding, I ran a red light because I love the lights here in Santa Clarita. The yellow lasts really long. That was like it turned yellow and boom, it turned red. And so I was speeding, I ran a red light, and then when he pulled me over, 
Uh, he informed me that the laws are different in their state and our kids needed to be in booster seats still at their age. And I'm like, this is going to be a very expensive ticket. I was freaking out. He went back to his car and after a while, the officer came back and he said, I'm going to let you go with the warning. And I couldn't believe it. And there was so much joy. I, I had broken those rules, those laws. I deserved the ticket, but I was forgiven. Now, God has let us off in Christ. Jesus has paid a huge debt for us. This is the gospel, and it brings joy to those who accept it, to those who believe it. This, the show, music show, The Voice. It's always so emotional when, when you see the chairs turn towards someone. You get all four chairs turned towards someone. You see the family members in the back crying because this is the dream for, you know, the person that they love is, is finally being chosen. God in Christ his chair turns toward us, turns toward you because of Christ, his death and resurrection, and your sins are forgiven. You're given a clean slate, not just a clean slate, but you're given the righteousness of Christ. If you just had a clean slate, there'd be no wrong, but there'd be no right either. But Jesus, in, this, in his life, he earned righteousness. He went into the, the wilderness and he was tempted by Satan with all the temptations that Adam and Eve faced and everyone ever since, and we all failed but Jesus didn't. He earned righteousness. He earned straight A's and then gave it to us in Christ. This is what Paul was so excited about in his life and why he had so much joy in the book of Philippians. Philippians 3 verse 8 and 9, he says, What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whose sake I have lost all things. And he's talking about all of his former accomplishments, all of his good works, he says, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. And he has joy about all this. Hebrews 10.10, 10, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He's given, he's offering you holiness. And if you have not taken him up on that offer, you really need to forgiven, given the righteousness of Christ, given holiness. You might not feel very holy, but if you put your faith in Christ, you will be holy. You will be a saint. Your behavior may not have caught up to your new identity in Christ yet, because that's a process. But a few verses later, Hebrews 10, 14, for by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So we have holiness, but it's a process. We're growing in holiness at the same time. Live in a manner worthy of the gospel. Well, these values Paul had in his life, and he's able in a prison cell to have joy. And I encourage you to internalize these same values, embrace them. They are humility, harmony, hope, hope in God and holiness through faith in Christ. And I want to invite you to pray with me about these things right now. Would you join me? Father, we humble ourselves and confess that we have sinned and done wrong, just as Daniel prayed, just as Nehemiah prayed. And we confess that America has done wrong. We've had many sins going back centuries and we thank you for the good things about America and for the godly influences and the good things that have happened. But Lord, we confess what's been wrong. And we ask for your forgiveness. And Lord, we seek you for the, the help of our nation. We, we pray for a turnaround. We pray for unity in Washington, D.C. We pray uh, that there be a move of your spirit there and in our whole land, that we would be united Lord, there's so much bitter division right now and only you can do something about it. But I believe as you do, there won't only be a spiritual revival leading to faith in you, but it will result in joy and blessing in this nation. And we ask for it, Lord. And I pray for anyone here who needs to know you, who needs to know the God that Paul knew in that prison cell, 
Lord, draw them by your spirit in Jesus' name. We thank you, God. We thank you, God. And if that's you right now, you only need to humble yourself, admit your sin, believe in Christ, grab hold in faith to him, and call on his name. Trust him with your life. A miracle will happen. He will come into your life. His Holy Spirit will come into your life. A whole new journey will begin. I encourage you to respond. Pray in your own way. Pray in your own words, but along those lines. And, and it'll happen. I believe that. It's, it's according to God's word, which says, All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, we're going to sing one more song here. And it is called Good, Good Father. And he is a good, good father. And because of that, we can have joy. Let's worship him as we sing this last song. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of why they think you're like, but I've heard a tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Oh, I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide because you what we need before we say your word you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and i'm low by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who i am you're a good good father it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm low by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You're perfect, you are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Love so undeniable I can hardly speak Peace so unexplainable I can hardly think as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still into love Love, love, love You're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm low by you It's who you am It's who I am who I am, you're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who 
I am. It's who I am. You are perfect. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us, you're a good, good father. It's who you are, who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Praise God, He is a good, good Father, and I hope that you know Him. And he, if you don't, he is waiting to know you. And I pray for your ble God's blessing on you. Go forth, whatever's going on in this world. We're going to keep praying. We're going to keep believing. Go in the joy of the Lord. And we will see you next time. God bless. Bye. Your